in biological systems, it's very useful to find a particular individual organism that specializes in the process that you want to study and then figure out from that organism how it has optimized its utilization of this process. And then you can look, because so many things are conserved through evolution, you can look and see how that process then is similar throughout other organisms that you're also interested in. For studying this sort of cytoskeletal assembly and disassembly and how actin polymerization is actually able to generate force, we've been very fortunate in the field that there is a particular bacterium, a pathogen that causes disease, which has learned how to harness the polymerization reaction that I just described in order to generate force in order to make you sick. And in retrospect, this really isn't so surprising. There are a huge number of examples in cell biology where we've been able to learn very interesting uh, facts about the process, the mechanisms of uh, cell biological functions within our own cells by studying pathogens, viruses, or bacteria that make us sick because those pathogens have figured out very clever, detailed ways to manipulate these processes in the cells of their host. And again, it's not surprising because if you think about the world that we live in, actually humans and in fact eukaryotes are a very minority species or a very minority group within this very complex world. In fact, if you even think about your own body and you add up all of the bacteria that live all over your skin and in your mouth and throughout your digestive tract and all the other non-sterile areas of your body, it turns out you have about 10 times more bacterial cells than you have human cells in the thing that you think of as your body. So you really are not so much an individual organism as you are a complex and thriving ecosystem of which the human cells are only a minority uh, represented species. Now, all of those other bacterial cells that live all over you are um, for the most part benign or even benevolent with respect to your own personal health. But on rare occasions and with particular bad species, pathogenic species of bacteria, a very small number of bacteria can make you sick. So in your gut, you might have 10 to the 14th bacteria, and yet if you drink a glass of water that has got as few as 100 organisms of a bacterium called Shigella flexneri, that will be sufficient to give you bacterial dysentery. So there's got to be something profoundly different about the way that these pathogenic bacteria interact with your body versus the way that all of the normal bacteria that cover us all the time interact with your body. And to oversimplify several decades of molecular level research in bacterial pathogenesis, the difference is that pathogens, organisms that cause disease, carry genes to encode for a certain number of proteins, a handful of proteins, that are able to specifically interact with proteins in human host cells and elicit very specific kinds of behaviors from those human host cells that result in the signs and symptoms of disease. So the particular example of this general principle that I'm going to talk about is actin-based motility by an organism called Listeria monocytogenes. This is a gram-positive organism closely related to Bacillus subtilis, which is found ubiquitously in the soil, and every time you eat lettuce that hasn't been properly washed, you eat some of this organism. Now, most of the time, this causes no problem at all. But if you're severely immunocompromised, or if you happen to be pregnant, then eating food that's been contaminated with Listeria monocytogenes can cause a very serious form of food poisoning, which is rare, but which can cause meningitis or can cause spontaneous abortion in pregnant women. These bacteria, after you eat them, invade the human body through the cells, the epithelial cells that are lining the intestine. And they do this with a series of proteins that bind specifically to receptors on those cells and then induce the cells to take them up. And uh, then they proceed to replicate within the cytoplasm of those cells uh, actually within the human host. The movie I'm about to show you here is a reenactment of that sort of process where we've taken an epithelial cell in tissue culture and fed it uh, some of these bacteria. The bacteria have invaded the epithelial cell and at the time this movie was taken, uh, they had been replicating within the cell for about five hours. So all of the individual bacteria that you see here, which are these little dark rods, are the clonal descendants of the single bacterium that got into this epithelial cell about five hours ahead of time. Now, as I start this movie, and this is now time-lapse, speed it up about 60-fold over real time, what you'll see is that these bacteria are zipping around inside of the cells. They look like speedboats. And behind each of the moving bacteria, you can see there's this dense streak, a phase-dense streak, which I'll tell you and then show you, is made up of actin filaments. And the way these bacteria are moving, you can see they're moving very straight, very rapidly, and very persistently, is by assembling actin filaments behind them and using the force generated by that actin assembly in order to push themselves forward through the cell. So let's look at this now a little bit more closely. Here we've taken an epithelial cell infected with these bacteria, fixed it, and again stained it with the mushroom toxin phylloidin, which specifically labels filament as actin structures within a cell.
In this epithelial cell, you see a number of different kinds of actin structures. For example, it's got edge fibers along the sides where it makes contacts with its neighbors. It's got stress fibers running up and down throughout, which enable it to um, build up traction against its substrate. And also, associated with each of these little red spots, which is a bacterium, you see either a cloud or a streak of actin filaments associated with bacterium. And every one of those actin filaments that's got that streak of, uh, every one of those bacteria that's got a streak of actin filaments coming out the back of it was moving rapidly at the time that the cell was fixed. Now, zooming in on this at the level of electron microscopy, we can see again the organization of the actin filaments associated with the bacteria in these structures, which were named comet tails by the very great electron microscopist Lou Tilney. Here, this is a thin section through an infected cell. And down here, you see a bacterium. And here, you see associated with it this long streak of its comet tail, which is made up of many thousands of actin filaments. You can just barely make out in this image all of the little individual actin filaments that are cross-linked together to form the comet tail. By examining the dynamics of the actin filaments in this kind of structure, what we know is that the filaments assemble only at the bacterial surface. And it's thought to be the assembly of those, of those actin filaments right at the junction with the bacterium, perhaps by one of these mechanisms where the actin filaments are bending and then monomers are adding on to push against the bacterium. That is thought to be the force that enables the bacteria to move through the cell. As the bacteria moves, it leaves this streak of actin filaments behind it that essentially are a record of where it has been. They're a track or a, a wake that the bacterium leaves behind. And those filaments that it leaves behind are cross-linked into this very dense branch network that actually remains stationary within the cell as the bacterium shoots forward. Now, at the very back end, you'll notice that the density of the actin meshwork seems to de be decreasing. And that's because the actin filaments actually are disassembling at the end of that structure, turning back into individual monomers that are then able to diffuse around within the cell. Some of those monomers can come back up to the surface here and contribute to the polymerization that will continue to push the thing forward. Now, I'd like to put a few numbers on this so you can appreciate how efficient, how fast this motor is compared to other sorts of biological motors, and also compared to macroscopic motors where you have a better sense of physical intuition about what is meant by fast and what is meant by strong. So the bacterium Listeria monocytogenes is about 2 microns in length, and it moves through a cell at a typical speed of about 0.2 microns per second, which means it takes 10 seconds for the bacterium to move one body length. And it does this through this very non-intuitive mechanism that I've been describing to you of piling up actin monomers behind it. And each individual actin monomer is between 4 and 5 nanometers across. Now, if we were to scale this up to a macroscopic object, what is the thing in the macroscopic world that seems to most resemble Listeria monocytogenes? Well, my graduate student, Fred Sue, has suggested that the thing that looks structurally most like Listeria monocytogenes is the Ohio-class nuclear submarine. As you can see, the structure is essentially identical. It's a cylinder, which is capped on either end by two hemispheres. And it moves through a liquid medium, leaving behind it a characteristic curved comet tail, which, as you can see, is very similar to the comet tail associated with Listeria. Now, this Ohio-class nuclear submarine is 560 feet in length, and a typical cruising speed is on the order of 30 feet per second. So if we were to scale up Listeria so they were actually as big as the submarine, how fast would it be moving? Well, we can scale up everything by multiplying out the sizes, assuming that the actin monomer is one foot in size. Then the Listeria would be 500 feet long, and its cruising speed would actually be 50 feet per second, which compares favorably with the speed of the submarine. Now, one thing that that means is if you're up on a satellite and you're filming submarines cruising around on the ocean, it would essentially look identical to the movie that I just showed you of Listeria moving around inside of cells. So this is rapid movement, and it's rapid really by anybody's criteria. The thing that I find really fascinating about this, though, is that the submarine has a basically pretty easy job to do. It just has to move through water. The bacterium has to move through cytoplasm. And cytoplasm is really complex. It's really dense. It's filled with organelles. It's filled with other filamentous structures. And the bacterium has to move at these incredibly fast rates, just as fast as a submarine, while breaking through or pushing aside all of these dense, complex structures that are actually found within the cell that's its host. So uh, to give you a little bit of a more uh, sort of vivid view of what that actually looks like from the point of view of the bacterium, I'd like to show you this movie, which was taken by one of my graduate students, Catherine Lacayo. Here she's taken some epithelial cells again in tissue culture and infected them with bacteria expressing the green fluorescent protein. At the same time in these cells, she's labeled the mitochondria red with a dye called mitotracker, which enables you to visualize the, loca the location, the size, the distribution of mitochondria in living cells.
Now, if you zoom in on this and look very closely at actually what happens when one of these moving bacteria contacts one of these great big mitochondria that's present in the cytoplasm, what you see is really very dramatic. What you can see, there's going to be a bacterium coming in from the top here. And I hope you can see as it runs into this big pile of mitochondria, it essentially slices right through them. And over here, you can see this in several different stills from the movie, where first the bacterium approaches the mitochondria, then it starts pushing its way through them, and then eventually pushes its way all the way through, leaving behind this wake where it's passed. Now, the thing that's really striking about this is that the bacteria practically don't slow down. Catherine was able to very carefully measure the speeds right before and right after collision, and they lose on the order of about 10% of their speed. So running through these mitochondria, through these dense thickets of organelles within the cell, as far as this motor is concerned, this engine that's driving the bacteria around, is really no more than a speed bump. And I think that really gives you a very visceral sense of the force, the energy, and the efficiency with which this kind of motor can work. There are several different things about this biological system that have proved to be extremely useful in understanding its function at the level of molecular detail. In particular, it's uh, turned out that we don't need an intact host cell in order to get the bacteria to move around at these very rapid speeds. You can extract cytoplasm from a host cell, drop the bacteria into the cytoplasm, and they'll form comet tails and move. These images here show bacteria that are actually put into a cytoplasmic extract from a frog egg, forming here in fluorescence actin clouds and actin comet tails associated with motion. Because you're able to break the cells open, then you're able to add proteins and take proteins away, and thereby the field has been able to determine all of the proteins that are necessary and sufficient for this form of movement. And this uh, cooperative work by a very large number of groups in the field resulted in 1999 in a really heroic reconstitution of this entire process by the lab of Marie-France Carlier where they were able to show that they could get fairly decent motility with just a mixture of four different proteins, and in fact, almost perfect motility with just a mixture of seven different proteins. So at the level of biochemistry, this is something that we actually understand fairly well. Now, at the same time, in order to understand the mechanics of this process, the physics, the force generation, we have to be able to manipulate not just the proteins that are involved, but also the object that they're pushing around. And one of my graduate students, Lisa Cameron, was able to reconstitute motility by taking a single protein from the bacterium and coating it on a polystyrene bead that's indicated here by the red arrow. And if you take this polystyrene bead, a plastic object, sort of an artificial bacterium, coated with just a single protein, and drop it into one of these extracts or into an appropriate mixture of purified proteins, then it will grow a comet tail and it will move around, and for all the world it will look just like a bacterium. So we can control both the proteins on the one hand and also the physical processes of the object that the, the actin assembly is pushing around on the other hand. And the combination of those two things has enabled a lot of very detailed molecular level understanding of what all the events are that take place with respect to motility for these bacteria, what order things happen in, what's important and what's not important. And so I'm going to very briefly summarize what's been more than a decade of work from more than 20 different labs focused on this particular problem of how these bacteria move. And as I mentioned, essentially all the interesting things happen right at the bacterial surface. So we're going to zoom in there and focus on events at the surface. So the first thing that happens, and in fact the only thing that the bacterium itself actually contributes to this process, is the bacterium expresses on its surface a protein. For Listeria monostogenes, that protein is called Act A. For other bacteria that do the same sort of trick, they can have other proteins. But the function of all of these proteins, which are essentially tied down to the bacterial surface, is to bind and activate a very particular protein complex that's present in the host cell called the ARP23 complex. And the biochemical activity of the ARP23 complex is to catalyze the nucleation of a new actin filament, which as you'll remember I told you was the rate limiting step in forming an actin filament. Now the ARP23 complex, indicated here by these little blue circles, binds to the bacterial protein and then it does two things. First, it binds to the side of a pre-existing actin filament and then second, it nucleates the growth of a new filament in one of these branched structures. As these branched structures then start to grow, individual monomers that are floating around in the cytoplasm are able to diffuse, find their way to the ends of the filaments that are close to the bacterial surface, and elongate. And again, because the filaments can bend and the individual monomers can sneak in between the ends of the filaments and the surface, that's able to push the bacterium forward. And it's really thought in the field, generally accepted, that there are no molecular motors involved in this process, and it's only the assembly, the growth of the filament that pushes the thing forward. Well, what next? As the bacterium is pushed forward, then old filaments are left behind. And some of these old filaments get sort of ripped off the surface, 
And you have a lot of uh, individual filament ends that are sort of left floating in space. And you have to have some way to stop those filaments from continuing to polymerize, or else you would end up with uh, essentially a big hairy mess of filaments growing everywhere, instead of just the very focused, directed thing that we actually see, which is filaments growing only close to the surface of the bacterium. And the thing that's responsible for that, and again, that's absolutely critical for motility, is a protein called capping protein, which comes in and binds, <laughs> which comes in and binds on the ends of these filaments um, and stops them from elongating. Now, a little bit later, the old filaments are then actively disassembled by a series of actin severing, actin depolymerizing proteins called ADF and cofilin that can regenerate the monomer pool that will enable um, this process to continue its steady state. And then once those filaments have been disassembled, then the monomers uh, again float around, reassemble, and the whole thing can continue on in a cycle at steady state, pushing the bacterium along essentially as long as its host cell is still alive. Now, Obviously, this is very important for the life of the bacterium, for its ability to cause disease. But as I've mentioned several times, all of these processes are very conserved throughout all of eukaryotic evolution. And in fact, it's now generally believed that there's a very similar process, a similar machine, that operates at the leading edge of crawling cells and is responsible for pushing out um, the protrusions as those cells move forward across the substrate. And this is an illustration from a review by Tom Pollard and Gary Borsey illustrating the individual proteins that are thought to be involved in this process and how they all play a role in terms of coordinating this structure. So the kinds of questions that we're very interested in in the field now, with this, armed with this level of molecular understanding about how these proteins assemble and disassemble, how their localization of assembly and disassembly is regulated, and some inkling about how it is that they actually are able to produce force to push things forward, the kinds of questions that we're interested in are summarized here. First, I've described to you mechanisms by which filaments could produce force, but there's no information in any of these theories about how efficient this motor is. Is this a good motor or a bad motor? Is there a lot of heat generated, a lot of waste? Uh, we would like to be able to actually directly measure the force generated by protein polymerization. Next, all of the examples I've shown you, certainly the bacteria, and then in a much more elaborate way, all of the crawling cells, cannot generate force just with assembly of a single filament. Instead, they have to have many different filaments that are all working together. And understanding how those things are coordinated and what really happens when you have multiple filaments trying to work together is, again, a very fascinating and open question. These actin forces that can push out the leading edge, of course, are only one step in cell motility. In order to actually get the whole thing to crawl, these actin forces have to be coordinated with other forces generated within the cell over, over time and over also very long cellular distances so the cell as a whole can maintain a particular polarity and can move in a particular direction. That's something we also don't understand very well. And finally, uh, when a cell is involved in uh, real life processes, it's not going through the, the kinds of procedures that I've shown you in these movies here. They were all taken under laboratory conditions that were very unchanging, very simple. Instead, a cell out in the wild has to deal with a constantly changing environment. And so not only does it have to be able to use these processes to generate force, coordinate them with each other, but it also has to be able to change them in order to respond to changes in its environment. This as a whole, I think, is a you know, sort of general roadmap for what many cell biologists are interested in now in the field of cell motility. And in the next segment, I'll describe some of the recent work from my lab focused on trying to answer these questions. <laughs>